been long enough. Um, but um, welcome everyone. Uh, we are just so, so thrilled to have you for this uh, speaker series. Um, and uh, we are just very excited for the year ahead and for all the, the learning that we can do together and the, um, the community that we can create around this important set of issues. Uh, my name is David Yeager. I am uh, the director of the Texas Mindset Initiative. Um, and there are a number of activities that we do in the Texas Mindset Initiative. One of the core ones is we run a fellowship for faculty here at UT who are innovating on practices that um, help promote experiences of inclusion and belonging in uh, classrooms, especially if we focus on, to the extent possible, large gateway courses that are essential for making progress towards uh, the degree. Um, and, uh, but another thing we do is we try to learn from experts in the field. And so through financial support from the College of Natural Sciences and the College of Liberal Arts and the College of Education, we are able to bring in uh, a series of uh, uh, experts from around the country to share the latest research on uh, the psychological approaches to creating experiences of belonging and inclusion in, uh, in classrooms. And so we're thrilled today to have some leaders in the field coming from the College Transition Collaborative, which is an initiative uh, run out of Stanford University and also partnering with a number of colleges and campuses across the country uh, to talk about their initiative that uh, really it was a model for what we've done here at Texas um, and also is a, just a close cousin of what we've done. And so we're thrilled to learn from their insights and see how we can adapt them. Um, I wanna warn everyone, we do have a Q&A at the end. Um, so we'd love to have your thoughts and comments. Feel free to add comments to the chat throughout. Um, we just can't expect our speakers to be monitoring that chat. Um, but I, if something urgent comes up, well, we might pop in and ask the speakers to clarify. Um, but really more than anything, Thank you for really just caring about the student experience here on campus and in Texas and for the work that you're doing. Uh, so thanks to all those in the audience who have come. And thank you especially to uh, Dr. Christy Ryan and Dr. Katie Boucher, who will um, present for us today. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Christy Ryan and Dr. Katie Boucher. Thank you very much for that um, warm welcome. Christy and I are very excited to be here to share insights from the Student Experience Project with you. We're gonna be focusing on um, classroom interventions that foster belonging and growth, very much with an eye toward advancing equity um, for students that are at least well served in higher education, um, but also specifically in STEM. Um, I'd be remiss though to not acknowledge three of our colleagues who have been very important in this work. So early on, Nicholas Bowman at the University of Iowa, and currently Mary Murphy at IU Bloomington and Christine Logal at Renison College at the University of Waterloo. The vision of the Student Experience Project, which we call affectionately the SCP, is to create equitable learning um, environments that support the success and retention of the least well-served students historically in higher ed, but also um, locally at the six partner institutions in SEP. This project is informed by decades of research now in social psychology, educational psychology, and brain science. And importantly, this project works to apply this research um, to develop new approaches and tools and resources to improve the student experience and to do so at scale. And so even though we've started with six institutions, we're working um, to be able to create tools that can go beyond those six institutions. And we also are working to inform higher ed um, to be able to really build the case for um, change in terms of including student experience like we use other assessment metrics. We wanted to start though um, with our presentation highlighting the why of this work, um, the why of our faculty focused work in this research practice partnership. And this comes from an SEP initiative um, in collaboration with Get Schooled, We Belong in College where students from one of our campuses highlight um, the reason why the student experience is important to them and why they feel they belong in college. 
This is my wee boy in college story. I was born in Mexico and I came here when I was two years old. I really struggled with managing my academics and my athletics. My sophomore year of high school, when I was told by a teacher that education might just not be something for me. Halfway through my first semester of freshman year, I realized that the coursework was really taking a toll on me. I was without a cell phone. I was without a laptop. My freshman year of college, I wanted to go back home. I called my parents. I was like, Mom, Dad, pick me up. Well, maybe this isn't for me. Do I belong in college? Maybe I'm in the wrong major. Maybe I should just do something different. I was unfortunately ready to transfer to a community college and pursue something I just wasn't interested in. That just wasn't OK with me. The way I overcame that was through my community. In college, there are so many resources, so many people that are there for you that can help you become a better person and help you reach your goals. I met teachers who made me want to be a better person and I am now in, in my senior year ready to apply to master's programs. If you just take one day at a time and focus on the now, you'll get through it. I promise. You know, it's not just about getting a degree. It's about becoming yourself. I am living proof that anybody can do it. You've got this. We belong in college. I know that not only I belong in college, but others belong in college too. As you heard from um, students from one of our institutions, I mean, you heard about their expectations and experiences and how those were impactful on their persistence in college. And so I'm now gonna speak to the growing evidence base of the power and form of these experiences. So how do these experiences of belonging and non-belonging, how do the experiences of um, doubts about our abilities in college, how do they shape um, how students engage, learn, and perform in the classroom? In the work of the SEP, we have heard from many students um, about how they experience the classroom, particularly the early gateway STEM um, classes. They are very much excited to be able to start a new term or to start their um, first classes on a college campus but oftentimes they're the first in their family to attend college. And so their excitement is also mixed with uncertainty about what these classes will be like. We also have spoken to non-traditional students who are returning to school and have young children at home. And their classes occur while their uh, children are also in school, but they're worried about um, how the college experience will differ from them outside of um, the lecture. We've heard from students who try really hard to pay attention in class, but they're also really worried about being able to afford that month's rent and groceries. Other students have been able to find a place socially on campus. So they've joined student organizations like Black Student Association or other identity affinity groups. But when they go to the classroom, they see very few students that look like them, even in large classes. And other uh, students have shared with us that they're really excited about their major, um, but sometimes um, other people are surprised that they're interested in those majors. And so in this work and in the evidence space that we refer to, we know that how students respond to these uncertainties and questions very much determine how they respond to challenges in their classes and ultimately how they perform in persistent college, especially in STEM coursework and especially early on in their undergraduate careers. So more specifically, when students experience a challenge or setback, whether that be critical feedback from an instructor, a low exam score or feelings of loneliness, we often go through this process of trying to understand why that's occurring and how we answer that question that influences the way we respond and then also how we perform. And for students who come from underrepresented or stigmatized groups in higher education, there's that additional lens of wondering sort of, is this setback relevant to my identity? And so if students believe that the experience is not typical, they might have the psychological interpretation that themselves or people like them don't belong or can't fit in, or can't succeed at college. And that psychological interpretation then can lead to the behavioral response of withdrawing from the social and academic environment, which then can prompt worse achievement and lower persistence, which can result in sort of a negative recursive process in which if you withdraw more, you perform worse and so on. The converse to this though, is when students believe that um, these challenges are normal, that it's sort of a typical part of the experience in the transition to college or transition to harder coursework in their major, and then it's normal to sort of worry about that too, to whether if it signals whether they should stay in this major or whether they belong. And so having this normalization process then allows for the student to psychologically interpret this as it's common um, to go through challenges like this and I can overcome them. The behavioral response then is this sustained engagement in the social and academic space, 
with higher achievement, greater persistence, and this positive recursive cycle then that leads to college completion. What we're particularly interested in the student experience project is understanding the cues in the classroom that prompt one of those two responses, right? What leads us to sort of the negative recursive cycle or the more positive one. And one thing that we've been focusing on are mindsets of intelligence. And so this has been originally conceptualized as an individual difference by Carol Dweck. And these mindsets have been shown to powerfully explain how students engage and perform. Um, students with a more fixed view of intelligence um, believe that sort of in intelligence is sort of this finite amount of ability, right? And it can't be easily changed. While students with a more growth-minded um, view of intelligence see abilities as being malleable with effort, but also learning. Um, so getting feedback um, and trying out new strategies when the effort um, is not showing um, the performance that they would hope for. Importantly, in our work, we focus on how faculty also have their own views of intelligence, and that shapes their instruction, their feedback to students, and their interactions with students. Our project adds to the evidence base that instructors are truly the culture creators in the classroom, that we communicate through our speech, through our practices, um, through what we decide to cover, whether we expect all of our students to succeed, uh, or whether we think that some of them might not be cut out for, uh, for success in our classes. These can be clear cues to our beliefs, like the look to your left, look to your right. One of you won't be here at midterm. One of you won't be here at the end of the class. And unfortunately, we still hear that as something that students mention in focus groups. It could be other offhanded comments like, now this is an advanced course or other things that really might signal doubt for students. Cues can also be more ambiguous, like how we approach and welcome students to office hours, whether we provide opportunities for practice, whether we allow students to see the incorrect answers to quiz or test questions. And importantly, these cues to instructors use a fixedness of students' ability or their growth potential meaningfully impact classroom experiences. So I'm gonna highlight a few more recent examples from the literature here. As one example by Catherine Minx, uh, Mary Murphy and colleagues, here's a racially and gender diverse sample of first and second year college students. These students were interested in STEM majors and they were asked the extent to which they perceived their STEM, uh, STEM professors as having more fixed or less fixed um, views of their abilities. You see, well, for um, students that perceived their STEM professor to endorse more fixed mindset beliefs, it predicted greater psychological vulnerability in that professor's class. So those students reported a lower sense of belonging. They were more concerned about evaluation and performance. They felt more like an imposter in the class, as well as just generally having more negative affect. This greater psychological vulnerability then predicted lower course engagement, lower STEM interest, not just in that class, but also in the field more broadly, and lower course performance. Importantly, it's not just students' perceptions of their faculty's views of ability. What you can see here, this pattern also emerges when faculty self-report their own views of abilities. So in this work by Elizabeth Canning, Mary Murphy and colleagues, students overall were found to perform more poorly in classes that were taught by faculty members who self-reported more fixed um, views of intelligence, but there were also inequities based on student background. So here you see based on racial identity. In particular, you see that the racialized outcome gap is more than twice as large in classes by faculty endorse more fixed views of intelligence. And this is across a large number of STEM faculty, an even larger number of courses across seven semesters and over 15,000 students. So what we see in the last, this slide and the last slide is that not only student perceptions, but faculty self-reports a fixed mindset very much influences not only students' experiences in the classroom, but also their performance. In addition to mindset views, our project also focuses on other cues that are present in the college environment that might cue belonging um, or non-belonging and inclusion or exclusion. So in past research and in focus groups that I've done in my own work independent of SCP, students share that they oftentimes are gonna question their belonging in times of difficulty. So whether the course material is difficult or just that it's in sort of that rough time of the semester, whether that is you know, midterms or close to finals, they question belonging in times of doubt when they're worried about um, their abilities in that major, the choice of that major, the choice of their institution. 
and in times of difference, when they feel othered or in other ways seen as distinct from their peers. And in particular, the cues that students mention are cues of underrepresentation, when they are one or a few um, of um, students that share um, backgrounds of theirs in the course, cues of marginalization, um, so having their backgrounds sort of not held in the same prominence or esteem in the course as other backgrounds, or having their experience spotlighted in some way or questioned. Students also mention that questions of belonging emerge when it appears that their faculty member doesn't appreciate their lived experiences. And this is in particular a theme that I've been seeing more in our SCP work, but also in other work, that our assumptions of who is the typical college student is shifting. These assumptions are being broken and our teaching is changing really to be able to support students where they are and with their whole selves in mind. And then lastly, especially with the pandemic um, occurring in a lot of, uh, or more virtual opportunities, we see that sometimes there are fewer opportunities though to meaningfully connect and share with near peers or people that students aspire to be like. And we do have um, research evidence to suggest that we can foster belonging. In fact, there are two studies, one in STEM and one um, outside of STEM that showcase ways in which we can um, foster belonging or allow students to gain them the muscle um, to um, find a sense of belonging on campus. So in particular, a social belonging intervention by Greg Walton, uh, Jeff Cohen, has shown that we can successfully foster a sense of belonging by having students read other students' stories, for them to understand that um, a lot of students in the transition to college um, have worries about whether they're gonna fit in, that it's common, and it's not a sign of, that, of non-belonging on campus. And also that it can pass with time or by taking agentic steps um, to be able to um, join a community or find ways in which to find connections on campus. And so in this uh, intervention, they read stories from previous students as well as craft their own belonging story by thinking about a time in which they didn't feel like they belonged and how this belonging message could actually be sort of applied to forward thinking um, to their time um, on campus. And although there were a variety of positive effects on self-report measures for students, um, what I have plotted here for you is GPAs over time. And what you can see um, in this original research is that following these students through um, to the uh, end of their college degree, this intervention led students to reframe um, their experiences in a way that they were more certain about their belonging and closed the gap between African-American and white students on their GPA. Importantly, in follow-up work led by Shannon Brady, they followed these students um, since um, graduating and have found that the African-American participants were still seeing the benefits from this intervention for their health, but also for community engagement, even years after graduation. And these effects were particularly associated with having a meaningful connection with a mentor during their college years. So this is another way in which we can see that faculty have that sort of meaningful impact and connection with students even beyond their time um, when students are in college. We also see that this um, is found in STEM. Um, so just like in the previous slide, we see the benefits of a similar social belonging intervention, but this time for women in STEM fields. So this um, project um, led by Greg Walton and, Chris, and Christine Logel um, looked at uh, women and men's experiences in a engineering course or engineering program that tend to be male dominated in terms of representation um, by gender. And this was at a prestigious, highly selective um, engineering program. And what you can see here is that um, in the control condition where um, students weren't sort of led through this process of hearing about other students um, belonging concerns and how they were able to resolve them without having um, that opportunity to write their own story, you see that women perform worse. This is their GPA at the end of the first year. They perform worse than their male counterparts. But for the students that took part in the social belonging intervention, you see that the gender disparity there closes and the effects continue throughout college, very similarly to the previous um, study. So in, in summary, the research base that we're drawing from demonstrates pretty clearly the learning environments that communicate that instructors, but also largely the institutions have a growth mindset about intelligence and that these environments also promote a sense of belonging, that we see that students feel supported um, in the classroom and outside of it. They also feel that they have a sense of fit in the campus community. Um, importantly, if they trust the people at the institution and believe that they'll be treated fairly, especially in terms of rating, and are not worried about being treated um, as a stereotype. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Christy Ryan, who's going to talk about the tools that we've developed um, for the Student Experience Project 
in our evaluation of these tools in our first full term of implementation. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, so as Katie said, my name is Christy Ryan, and I'm the Director of Research at the College Transition Collaborative. Uh, and um, we, as part of this project, CTC's role is to lead the development of the approaches that institutions will use to better support their students' social belonging, um, growth, and success, um, as well as to sort of oversee the evaluation of our implementation metrics. So I'm gonna walk you through how we've approached this process and what we've learned in our first term of implementation. But before we jump into that, I also just want to briefly introduce our other partners in this work. The SCP is a uh, fairly large collaborative of uh, including the Association for Public Land Grant Universities and six of their urban serving university institutions who are named at the top of your screen there, as well as four national education organizations. Um, and we are all supported in this work together by the Rakes Foundation. Uh, and one of the goals of our work, I think an important um, framing for the approach that we've taken is that our collective goal was really not to recreate the foundational evidence base that Dr. Bauscher just provided an overview of, but instead we really wanted to draw on this established uh, body of evidence to develop practical approaches that instructors could use and institutions could use to create the learning conditions that research has shown really promotes academic success and well being and can be uh, helpful for promoting greater equity in outcomes for students. Um, so, to begin our work together, uh, we started with a diagnostic inquiry to identify common challenges that were faced by all six of our institutions and to really narrow our focus. And when we came together in this work, we didn't have a clear idea of where we were going. It was very much a collaborative effort to identify the area that we wanted to work in. The sort of grounding for our time together was that we wanted to address gateway STEM and we really wanted to support students' experiences in that area, but otherwise we were sort of an open field in terms of where our primary focus would be. So we began our work with a, a diagnostic inquiry, including surveys and focus groups with more than 8,000 students, faculty, and staff at our partner institutions, as well as an institutional assessment of more than 84,000 students' academic outcomes. And we were looking at more than 10 different aspects of student experience, as well as key performance outcomes, uh, many of which Katie touched on previously. Uh, and this effort really provided us with a rich data, data set to sort of guide our future decision making. And some really important things pretty immediately bubbled to the surface. The first, as Katie has already alluded to, was the need to focus on students who have been historically excluded and who are underserved in higher education. Um, across all of our campuses, for example, we found that students from structurally disadvantaged racial groups and students who are experiencing high levels of financial stress, which the SEP defines as experiencing some measure of basic needs and security, uh, were up to two to three times more likely to report experiencing identity threat or concerns about being judged based on their group membership in their courses than were their peers. They also had up to 16% higher DFW rates in gateway STEM courses than did their peers. Um, so we, we knew immediately that we really wanted to focus on creating better learning environments for these students in particular. Uh, and the diagnostic also uncovered a real clear opportunity for impact at the classroom level. Um, our surveys and focus groups with students, faculty, and staff illuminated some real mismatches and misperceptions in terms of faculty perceptions about students' experiences and the obstacles that students faced in their education and what students reported themselves. Uh, as And when we shared back our phase one reports with our school partners, we also found that while the staff and administrators on our site teams that work quite closely with students were not particularly surprised to hear about the hardships and challenges their students were facing, many faculty told us that they were actually quite surprised to learn that their students 
were struggling particularly with basic needs insecurity and high levels of stress. And it was really eye-opening for many of our partners to hear directly from students how those hardships were creating barriers to their learning and growth in the classroom. So we came out of the diagnostic sort of knowing that we wanted to directly engage faculty in our work together and that we wanted to focus on um, students who are currently underserved in higher education. Can you, can, oh, perfect. Um, and the diagnostic findings coupled with the evidence base that Katie has just provided an overview of also helped us hone in on the aspects of student experience or the uh, social psychological constructs that we really wanted to attend to in this project as well. And we ended up identifying five core components of the student experience that are known to have a bearing on students' academic engagement and persistence, and also that we know can be a lever for driving more equitable student outcomes. So those are the institutional growth mindset, or some might say the growth mindset culture that is created in the classroom, um, students' feelings of social belonging and their identity safety within the classroom, as well as their trust that their instructor will treat them with fairness and respect and then their own feelings of self-efficacy regarding their ability to succeed in the course in the major and more broadly in their college ambitions now we know from the research base that any one of these constructs is very important for students experiences of their learning environment and has an impact not only on students' academic outcomes, but often on their well being as well. But one of the goals of the SEP was really to create an overall bar for students' global experiences of their learning environment. Um, we wanted to set an expectation that a positive student experience was one that addressed all of these. And so, we combined all of the items across these measures into a single metric, which we call the student experience index. And in a few moments, I'll talk a little bit more about how we measure that throughout the process project. Uh, but it is the kind of core metric that we use to evaluate our work together. Uh, so, you know, now we have the problem we want to address and we know how we're going to focus it. Of course, the next phase of the project was really to develop the tools and resources that would support the faculty who are joining us in this journey to make changes in their classrooms. So uh, the College Transition Collaborative worked with our partners across the SEP to lead the development of several professional development tools that, um, that our instructors have been using in the project. And the first of those is the SEP Practices Library. The Practices Library is a collection of evidence-based and field-tested resource guides that outline steps that instructors can take in their courses to promote engagement, increase equity in students' experiences of their learning environment, and ultimately support their academic success. And our practices library, which is actually the, one of the first of the publicly released SEP tools available on CTC's website, is organized generally into three bundles or topic areas. Um, the first focuses on starting the term off strong with growth mindset and social belonging foundations. And this area of the practices library really includes a collection of resources that instructors can use leading up to the start of the term and in the first few weeks of the term to help effectively communicate to students that they have a growth mindset about students' abilities and that they are ready to be their partner in learning throughout the term. And also to help facilitate opportunities for students to really develop a sense of belonging in the classroom, either by sharing their own belonging stories, as Katie mentioned earlier, or by facilitating connections between instructors and peers or peer-to-peer -peer uh, connections in the class. And importantly, the resources in this bundle are intended to start at the beginning of the term, but can be reapplied throughout the term for continuity throughout um, an instructor's messaging um, throughout the course. The second sort of area that we focus on is providing feedback in a way that fosters engagement and growth. Uh, and of course, here we draw very heavily on the work of David Yeager um, to help support our instructors 
in providing feedback that is wise and that students are assured that the instructor both has uh, high standards and high expectations for the course, but also believes that the students are capable of meeting those standards and is a partner with them in their success to provide the support and resources necessary for them to learn and grow their abilities. Uh, this area of the library also includes guides for developing exam wrappers that help students to exercise their metacognitive muscles with regard to their ability to learn from past mistakes and hone their study skills. And then lastly, we have a bundle focused on create, cultivating a supportive and inclusive classroom environment. And the supports in this area of the library really focus on helping instructors identify things that they can do to create a classroom that is identity safe for all students in their, in their courses. Uh, we also provide a resource for addressing identity threatening uh, incidences when they happen in our courses, on our classroom, in our on our campuses or in our communities more broadly. Um, and because it has become such a focus of the SEP and something that clearly is impacting our students very deeply, this section of the library also includes a resource for supporting students who are experiencing basic needs and security and high levels of financial stress. Um, each of the Bundles in the practice library has a corresponding online professional develop mo development module that our participating instructors in the project use to help build their skills in these areas, particularly if this area of work is new to them. And it, these modules really focus on providing the evidence space and socializing some of these ideas, as well as helping instructors to develop and enact the recommendations in the practice library in a way that truly feels authentic to who they are as instructors and also fits with the unique context of their classroom, the size, modality, and um, topic areas that they cover. Um, of course, in order to track our progress in the project, we need a way to measure students' experiences throughout the term. Um, the effort to develop a tool for us to do that has been led by our partners at PERTS who also have collaborated across the network to create the Ascend measurement tool. Um, this is a tool that they are still developing and our, our partners we are all using in its beta version. Um, it is a professional development tool that instructors can use to survey their students about their student experiences and within our project participating instructors utilize this tool three to four times a term to ping students about how they are feeling across all of the dimensions of student experience that we are focused on in the project. Um, after a report or after a survey period is complete, that instructor then receives an automated and confidential report that provides them with insights into how their students are faring in their course and how their experiences are impacting their ability to learn and grow. And um, these reports are disaggregated by both social psychological construct that we're addressing in the project, as well as by student group membership to better help our instructors identify places where perhaps there isn't quite yet equity in students' experiences in their courses. The Ascend reports also link directly back to the SEP practices library so that as instructors identify areas that they would like to focus on, they can be linked right away to the resources that hopefully will help them enact new changes in their courses to support student success. Um, and then very importantly, as instructors are going through this process, each of them is working within a community of practice at their home institution that is led by their SEP site team. And I think one of the things that we have really taken away from this project is how incredibly valuable the communities of practice are for creating sustained momentum and a lot of uh, real student impact in this project. So communities of practice meet regularly to allow instructors time to connect with each other, 
to share their insights, what's going well, where the challenge points are, and to learn from each other in their improvement process. Um, I can go ahead and go to the next slide. And I will introduce uh, one of our SEP participating instructors, Shishala Nottenbelt at the University of New Mexico. And we'll just share with you now um, a reflection for Shushila on what engaging in this process has been like from her. Although my fail rates had dropped significantly, every semester I continued to lose students, and these were students who never visited my office hours or connected with me. It was frustrating not to be able to reach them all. Not understanding why this was happening, it was easy to label them again as the problem. Perhaps they were not ready for the challenge of a difficult, fast-paced college science class. What was I missing? Were there other barriers to their success that I couldn't see? I didn't think there was anything more I could do to help, but I did wonder, what would it look like to have a classroom where every student felt like they had the same chance to succeed? Where my class was a stepping stone to their future and not a barrier or a locked gateway. Through the Student improve, uh, Experience Project, I learned about the simple and powerful connection between belonging and growth mindset and how these impact student engagement with a class and its support resources. The Copilot Ascend tool showed me equity gaps that existed in my own classroom, a shock to me because I thought it was already a very inclusive environment. I started to understand and think about the, the gap between intent and impact. SEP has provided me with tools to help assure all of my students that they belong and can succeed in my class. I've learned to communicate this at every point I can, with direct messages as well as more subtle cues. It starts in my syllabus and continues through regular course messaging, through sharing my own mistakes, as well as the journeys of my wonderful and diverse group of former students, now emerging professionals in a variety of fields. My fall implementations led to significant improvements in the student experience and the highest ever pass rate in a general chemistry one class that I have taught despite a global pandemic, which mandated a completely new teaching and learning style. Okay, so um, that's a little bit from one of our participating instructors on what this experience has been like for them. And as you heard, you know, Dr. Nottenbelt has seen some improvements in her own course in terms of students' experiences and outcomes. Um, but what about the rest of the um, network? Uh, over the first term of implementation, which was in the fall of 2020, and certainly a very uh, interesting time to be kicking off our actual implementation together, uh, we were very excited to see that every college's pilot team improved student experiences, uh, particularly in the areas of social belonging and identity safety. And this was across more than 100 instructors on our six college campuses. Uh, over the term, the share of students who were reporting positive learning experiences on the student experience index, meaning that they were experiencing a high, a very positive experience of their learning environment across all five of the social psychological constructs we are focused on, increased by 32%. And we saw our greatest gains for Black, Latinx, and Native women in particular. And of course, not everyone improves student experiences the same amount. We did have some instructors who moved the needle significantly more than their colleagues. And in fact, those who, who improve student experiences the most did so at more than two times the average of the network. And as part of the SEP's commitment to all teach, all learn, and to benefit from each other's expertise in many areas, uh, we really sought to identify these folks and invite them to share with the network the practices, approaches, and techniques that seem to be the most um, useful in their courses. Now, of course, it's lovely to, and very important, I would argue, to improve students' experiences of their learning environments, 
but we really want to know also if that is associated with grades as well and their academic outcomes. And we're happy to find that it is. Uh, what you're seeing here is a graph that shows the probability of receiving an A or a B in a STEM course by change in student experience index over time across that fall 2020 term. So here, change in SEI uh, is a continuous variable. And um, we find that is okay, Katie, you can go ahead and we find that in fact, as SEI score increases over the term, the predicted probability of a student receiving an A or B in their STEM course also increases. Um, and then as I think the big takeaway for our team here is that it's not really where you begin the term, but it's where you end the term. And there's a lot of value in investing in students' experiences over the course of a class because SEI change itself is highly correlated with students' outcomes. And we see that this relationship is replicated for DFW rates. So this is the same chart showing the predicted probability of receiving a DF or withdrawing from a STEM course by change in SEI. Um, and here we see as well that as SEI score increases over the term, the predicted probability for receiving a DFW really diminishes across all of uh, all of the students in these courses. And so again, it's really not where you where you start, it's where you end, particularly by the midterms point or later. If we can move students' experiences into a positive range by that point, um, we see that they're their likelihood of earning a DFW has diminished. Um, both of these charts focus on all students in our STEM courses, but on the next slide, we will hone in on those students for whom we really wanted to focus in the project. And those are students who have been historically excluded from higher ed or who continue to oftentimes be underserved, either in higher education or in STEM courses in particular, um, or who are underrepresented in these courses. And what we see here, they, what you're seeing here is the percent of underserved students who received an A or B in STEM courses by their student experience index score. So were they having a globally positive experience of their learning environment or were they not? And we find that students who have been traditionally underserved in higher ed who were in the SEI target range by the midterm point or later were significantly more likely to earn an A or a B in their STEM courses than their peers who were not in, a, in that target range. So in other words, their peers who were not having a positive experience across all five constructs. And we find that this positive association between being in the SEI target range and um, our outcome persists with DFW rates as well. Students who are in the SEI target range by the midterm point or later are significantly less likely than their peers who are not having a globally positive experience to earn a DF or withdrawal from their course. Uh, and with that quick snapshot of our first term findings, I will hand it back over to Dr. Bauscher for our closing remarks and reflections. So before turning it over to you all to see what questions or comments that you have for us, we just wanted to give a few sort of takeaways, so lessons that we've learned. Um, Christy um, provided the findings for fall 2020, but we've scaled in spring 2021 to include more faculty. And this is our currently our last year of sort of data collection or active partnership with our campuses. And just big takeaways so far for us is that attending to students' experiences has a meaningful impact on students' um, outcomes, especially during times of high stress, like the current pandemic that we're um, experiencing. But we also found that faculty are reporting benefits themselves. So they're finding more joy in their work, more interest in teaching, and also finding that students are um, just on their own writing anonymous um, um, comments about how great the class is, giving more positive student evaluations for faculty who have really focused on this work. That in order for this work to be the most um, impactful, communities of practice where faculty regularly meet to be able to support one another. And the greatest improvements, particularly for the bright spots that Christy mentioned, are faculty that are maintaining the focus on the student experience across the term. So in addition to focusing on the first week as being a critical week, following through with messages about belonging and growth throughout the term, and also more consistently measuring those students' experiences to be able to see how those um, equity, equity gaps um, are narrowing. 
And now we're currently working as we uh, end our partnership with the campuses to think about how this can scale, but also be sustainable um, in the, the work um, within um, institutions and across it. And with that, I will turn it over. I think Matthew, you're gonna help facilitate our Q&A if any questions came in the chat. And thank you all very much um, for your attention. Absolutely. Um, Great. Yes. Yeah. And I'd like to encourage everyone to add questions to the to the chat. Um, thanks for this um, inspiring talk and this great information. Um, let me give everyone a moment to add questions to the chat. So I'll, I'll help facilitate, but let's let's try to get a couple of questions in before we dive in and answer any. Okay, um, I'd encourage everyone to keep uh, adding questions, but I think the first question is from Brad and it's how did you get faculty buy-in? And I think the follow-up is just, can you tell us your thoughts about um, going beyond the kind of selected group of faculty to broader group and what do you think would need to change to recruit broader groups of people? So initially um, our faculty participated with a monetary incentive um, but obviously sort of that runs to the end when the grant ends. And so campuses are, are now working to think about ways to incentivize beyond that. And so some of them have um, created um, sort of names or fellowships um, for faculty who participate. They are um, off offering um, grants to be able to support like scholarship of teaching and learning or other opportunities to be able to publish and present based on faculty's own research questions from the project. Um, also, we've um, actively had deans and other upper administration um, individuals involved um, in this project from the beginning. And so they've been very supportive of their campuses work on this, making it a, an initiative or a part of their strategic planning. So it also helps to then be able to have institution support as well. And I think and the only thing that I would add to that is that we've been very excited and pleasantly pleased to find that the faculty that were first involved in this uh, work have become incredible ambassadors for it on their campuses um, and have really reached across campuses to encourage other faculty to take this on. We have had folks from one school's engineering program who really got on board and got very excited about the work go and speak to the engineering faculty at another school to share their experiences and the value that they've gotten out of the work and encourage their participation. Uh, and I think that that has really, hearing it from another faculty member, particularly someone in their field, say that they think that this work is worth doing in a value add, I think has been very helpful, particularly for some pockets of uh, maybe like not your likely subject, you know, not the likely suspects. Great, so uh, follow-up is it kind of Uri's question and an elaboration on it. So how do you, what lessons have you learned about faculty receptiveness? And the follow-up is, were there any faculty that you initially targeted in like 2019 who didn't, who ended up not participating and who dropped out? And are there any lessons you learned from that um, for tailoring it for the future? You want me to give a first pass at that, Katie? <laughs> Sure, I was just immediately sort of thinking about how, um, I, th I think for our project, um, we have a continuous improvement approach where we ask our faculty to measure change multiple times in the semester. And I think for some faculty that seems sort of an easier way to sort of meld with their way of teaching than others. And so I think that that was one of the things that we've been working on um, the most in this project is really helping faculty think of other ways to be able to to tell um, how their students are doing in the moment, to be able to gauge that growth over time. And the other thing too, is Christy mentioned all of our um, change bundles, all of our um, practices that we provide to faculty. 
There's one change bundle that I think some faculty are uh, less comfortable um, addressing in terms of like identity threatening events um, or really naming bias, really naming um, identity issues in their classes. Um, and so that is something that um, depending on how strong the community of practice is at a campus might make it so that a faculty member might be less receptive to start um, doing some of this work or to continue um, doing that. Great, Uri, do you wanna, were there any follow-ups you wanted to ask, you add? Oh, you're on mute. I'm at my best when I'm on mute, David. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for this. This is so important. I noticed that uh, you talk a lot about the successes and I've seen many of them, but you don't talk in your work about any of the possible risks. And that's what makes it very different from the papers that distributed NSF by behavioral economists or the public health-based interventions. They have traditions of being real clear about risks, even if they're minor. I don't see that in your work. How come? Are there absolutely no risks at all to any of these ideas? So there definitely, there definitely are risks. And I think that we thought a lot about them as we were crafting um, the resources to faculty, talking about like what, what could go wrong? What are the key ingredients? How could you, you know, message belonging in a way that might backfire? Um, how could you um, give wise feedback statements that might not feel authentic and backfire? So I think part of the answer to your, your question is we tried to sort of think about what those could be to provide sort of like guardrails of like, try make sure to use these ingredients in your approach. Um, but there's, you know, obviously I think, you know, risks in all efforts to be able to change students' experiences and to change outcomes. Um, and there's also risks to, to, to faculty. I think a lot of faculty were really worried at first about how participating in this would make it seem as if they were less inclusive um, because they were actually asking students about it, um, that they were gonna get poor student evaluations. And a good number of our faculty are non-tenure track. And so teaching evaluations mean a lot. And so I think there definitely were risks that we in our communities of practice would talk to and think about how we could mitigate them. Uh, let me, can I just ask a follow-up, David? So though there are risks that come from poor implementation, God, I, know, I understand those <laughs> in my own work. There are also risks from the use of powerful ideas in environments in which there's lots of complexity. So the forces, the American social forces of racialization, for example, are incredibly profound and subtle. So raising ideas of identity, particularly in populations like Latino populations, where there's a lot of complexity to that, people striving for white identity or um, depressing identity, could have adverse effects. So do you notice in any of your data adverse effects to the proper uses of these interventions? That's the kind of risk analysis you might see in a public health study, not just implementation failures, but when you're using extremely powerful psychological techniques, just exquisite work, surely there must be cases where they go awry and don't fit particular demography or features of student personality or experience. So what have you learned about those? You must be looking at those in your research. What have you learned about them? Christy, I'll let you speak to that since you've, you've been dealing with ins and outs and the data a little bit more than I have. Uh, yes. Yeah, so in terms of, so one thing that is quite tricky about our work and, and that is quite different than traditional empirical academic work is that assessing the sort of those level of impacts is quite difficult in our project design. So we have not looked at the negative impacts directly of implementing the work poorly or well, because frankly, there is a lot of difficulty in us truly assessing how well faculty are implementing these once they are out of our hands. As Katie noted, we have tried our best to provide supports for them to hope that it goes well. And we've been very responsive as we hear back from our colleagues about things that didn't quite go as planned, helping to revise our, our practices to help avoid those same pitfalls in the future. 
Um, but, you know, I think that your note about the complexity of student experience is really important. And one of the important pieces of data that we do have is qualitative feedback from our students mm -hmm. um, through the Ascend platform that asks them um, at random to explain why they've answered a question in a particular way. And we certainly do have a variety of students. Some of the things that makes once, you know, certain students feel safe, make other students feel more put on the spot and more marginalized. Um, and so while we know that there's great empirical evidence to support the use of these approaches, and we've tried to be quite careful about only promoting the ones, you know, the, the approaches that we feel like are very safe and unlikely to negatively impact students, um, they are perceived differently by, uh, by different groups, different individuals. And so one of the most important threads that runs through all of our change practices and recommendations is for instructors to really come to this work seeing all of their students as individuals who have very complex lives outside of the classroom and to focus on students more as whole people um, rather than as groups of individuals and just to be able to have the tools in their tool belt to acknowledge the fact that identity is something we all bring with us into our encounters in the world um, and that we do have different experiences of the world because of that and to honor the fact that the way that they perceived college or the way that they experienced college may be quite different from the experience that their students are having for a variety of different reasons. Um, I wish that I could speak to more empirically to the question that you asked, um, but unfortunately, I don't think I'm- I think it's an important thing to um, kind of keep an eye on. I, I know in the, the faculty fellows here at, at UT, um, when, when they were introduced to things like telling your belonging story, right and being vulnerable right they raised that the possibility that members of their group already are constantly challenged about whether they are authorities in academia so like um faculty of color needing to command a room of mostly white students and they may constantly have be having their credentials challenged by students and if they tell a story about how they failed their freshman calculus class then it's just confirming a stereotype about their group already. So I think that was something that the structure of our fellowship brought out because it it was kind of designed to have people customize and kick the tires on things. Um, but I think there's not yet a systematic framework for those kinds of safeguards. And I think that's, Uri, I think what you're pointing to the need for, and um, which I think is very important. And the, we we're, we're out of time, sorry, we're out of time, but I wanna make sure we get, get, I can raise Vernita's question, which I think is a great one. Uh, and it's about being very discipline specific. So the CTC practices guide is generic, right? It says, you know, and it's designed with intro, large intro courses in mind, but there's nothing about, you know, theorems or physics or chemistry in it, right? Um, but for a disciplinary person, there often there's a ton of work and even what would seem like superficial customizations for uh, your discipline. Um, so anyway, I think, Vernita, the question is, um, how, do you, um, how do you start thinking about allowing people to customize things for their discipline and make it easier for them, especially once you want to get to the people that are not the early adopters? Vernita, I did think I represent actually your question? Actually, my question is, oh. for people like me who have a track record of writing really bad exam questions that were unintentionally ambiguous and screwing stuff up and found that they did much better when they stuck to like course material that was written. So they had a scaffold that had been pre-tested. I really like these ideas. I'm afraid that I'm going to screw up implementing them the same way as I've screwed up exam materials in the past when I tried to write my own questions because I thought I was being clever. What I would like is materials that I can't screw up. Uh, yeah, so we we are we are working on the final version of the practices library will be integrated with a larger change package that will provide examples that are from discipline specific um, change practices. And so like somebody in physics will provide their exam wrapper, somebody in um, biology is already doing their wise feedback discussion boards, like things like that, that could actually be more sort of I see a colleague that has a similar class like mine. Um, that has adopted it and will go through a process of us checking 
through the materials before it goes up in the change package so that that will then be available alongside the current practices library. Yes, and providing examples that instructors can adapt is um, is something that we've heard from many instructors is very important, right? How much of this can I take and um, and utilize in my course? Um, and also we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for instructors to adapt to who they are as instructors, um, to make it authentic to them and appropriate for their context. Um, and I also just want to plus one the comment about vulnerability and close with saying that, David, your observation about how some of these changes are easier, more appropriate, and more helpful to certain instructors and others is something that we've absolutely experienced in the SAP as well. Um, and we have, uh, one of the things that each of the practices comes with is a checklist that can help faculty think through if and how they want to implement different changes in their courses. And something that we really encourage all faculty to think about is, is this comfortable for you? And, and does this feel like a, you know, a good and, and safe, for a better word, practice for you to implement? Um, and is it something that you feel like you can implement authentically in your course? Because I think that that is so important to having these work for faculty and work for students. Um, and you know, certainly it's been our experience that the belonging story is far less um, popular among women who feel like they are perhaps challenged in their courses or um, non-white faculty. Um, and, and that's super important. And Yeah, I, I think it speaks to this broader need to figure out how to, but both Renita's question and the risk question, to, to how to have libraries of practices that are not vetted, but informed by real use mm -hmm. and where there's been, and there was a community of use around them. Um, and that implies a different model for content creation than, than the kind of expert design model. It implies more of a crowdsource model, which then generates new problems. Like how do you, how do you trust the crowd? Um, you know, in the ways that you, you can't do it like Wikipedia where anyone can fact check it because ultimately the question of whether your practice works or not, it depends on how it makes the students feel. Um, and that's, and we hardly ever have those data linked. So I think the next phase is gonna be something about broader communities of people with linked practices and data where you can continually update things. Um, any other, we're over time. I think some people are going to have the good fortune of being able to talk with you afterwards. Uh, but are there any other just comments or thoughts from folks here? You know, these are talks, but also we're trying to create an intellectual community here on campus around these ideas. And this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation. So curious if anyone else wants to add ideas or thoughts either to the chat or, or feel free to unmute yourself before we end. Are you making this recording available afterwards? Yes. Great. And there were many other interested people who wanted to join, but CNS was having a talk on equity right now. This is unfortunate scheduling. So we're gonna have a watch party with lots of lots of folks from CNS. So there will be a there will be a rerun of show for this uh, session later. All right, well, let's wrap up. Matthew, could you just very briefly preview our, the rest of our speakers? We have some really, truly amazing people coming up um, for more talks, I think. Uh, but Matthew, do you wanna let us know? Yeah, yeah, we actually have uh, five more talks. Five more um, talks. Yeah, we have our next one is um, four weeks from today. They're all at the same time. Um, and uh, in November, it'll be two um, people from UT. It'll be Dr. Stacy Sparks and Dr. Eric Smith. And both of them, I think, were, are on this uh, meeting right now. Um, and they'll be talking about their project they did with undergraduate learning assistants here at UT, um, where they, um, so that, that'll be great. And then, then uh, we come back in January with Dr. Sapna Shurian, who was also present today for this. Um, and she's at the University of Washington. Um, and then Amanda Diekman, University of Indiana, Dr. Kayvon uh, Stassen from Vanderbilt, um, and Dr. Marco Molinaro. Uh, from University of California Davis. Um, 
I'll be sending out a link to the recording to everyone who registered, and I'll also send out a the, the list of the talks so you can see those. Um, and then we'll send out invitations for each talk um, about three weeks before each talk. Great. And I guess that we'll leave you with is just a charge that continue these conversations, talk to each other about how we can improve the student experience and promote equity on our campus and around the country. So thank you all for your attention and interest, and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you thank so much. You thank you. Thank you all.